this time of year, I want to be excited and filled with hope and joy. But I find myself rushing, stressed, and stretched too thin. And I can be anxious and overwhelmed. But I know there's more to life than stress and survival. I know there's more to life than going it alone. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For me. For you. For the world. To have hope when I feel hopeless. He gives me rest when I'm weary. There is joy when I am downhearted. In the midst of the deepest longing, I am so loved. I am so loved. We are so loved. Well, good morning. So glad that you're here with us or joining us online. Grab your Bible and let's go to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two this morning. And uh, throughout this Advent sermon series, we're focusing on the story of Jesus' first coming told on the pages of Luke chapter two, looking at different characters in that story. And it strikes me thinking about this story that there is perhaps no moment in a mother's life that is filled with more joy than that moment when her newborn child is laid in her arms. Despite all the pain and travail of labor, there's no moment more filled with joy than, than that moment. Despite having a notoriously bad memory, I remember that moment at the birth of each of our three children with crystal clarity. Um, the, the one that stands out perhaps more than the others, uh, not because he's more special than the other two kids, but because of the unique circumstances of his birth, is the birth of my son Pearson, my second child. At the time, we were living in Illinois, in, in Wheaton, and uh, it, it was a challenging pregnancy for Kim. She was dealing there at the last with terrible problems with her sciatic nerve, that nerve that runs down your back and through your hip. And, and she was just really having a hard time getting around. I'll never forget, we were, we were going to Target right close to the end of, of her pregnancy. And, and she was wearing this pink track suit and just struggling to move. I mean, she just sort of waddled through Target. At one point, we actually had to stop and have her sit down on one of the rockers that was up on a pedestal on display. I mean, she was having a hard time getting around. We knew what his birthday was gonna be because we had a scheduled C-section. It was gonna be uh, February the 24th. So we were planning everything around February 24th. And then Valentine's Day came. And Kim was going down the stairs into our basement to take a cookie to our three-year-old, Will. And as she started down the stairs, that nerve just gave out. Her leg gave out and she fell down the stairs. Boom, 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 down on her rear end, down the stairs into our basement. She felt okay, the baby seemed to be fine, but the doctor was concerned and wanted us to go into the hospital. So we went to the hospital. They uh, hooked her up to a monitor, everything looked fine, but they did a blood test and they were waiting for the results to come back from the blood test from the lab. And they waited a long time. But the nurses knew she was fine, so they didn't keep coming in and checking on us. And, and the day went on, and we were waiting, and we were waiting, and we were waiting. It was Valentine's Day, so we were trying to figure out how we were going to adjust our Valentine's Day plans once they let us go. Will, our three-year-old, was with us watching the same Dora the Explorer DVD over and over again on my laptop. And we just sat there waiting and waiting and waiting the nurses didn't come check on us, and eventually Kim actually got dehydrated and went into labor. She starts having contractions, and so then they gave her medication to try to stop the contractions, to, to try to stop the labor, and the medication didn't work. And so the doctor came in and says, well, we're having a baby. Now, my mom was here in Dallas, and she had already determined she was going to come up and try to help take care of us for the last 10 days before Pearson was born. When she got on the plane in Dallas, we were planning on meeting her back at our house. By the time she landed in Chicago, we already had a baby. I'm scrambling to figure out, what do I do with my three-year-old? And so I call a buddy of mine who was in the PhD program with me. He and his wife were having their Valentine's date, and they stopped what they were doing to come and get Will to take him to McDonald's for a Happy Meal. I met them in the lobby, gave them our three-year-old, headed back upstairs, got my scrubs. They were wheeling her in to the operating room for a C-section. 
but I'll never forget that moment. That moment when they laid that tiny little baby in his mother's arms. What incredible joy. And can you even imagine the joy that Mary must have felt? The joy that she felt as they laid baby Jesus in her arms. This morning, we're in the third week of our Advent Sermon Series, and um, we, we're calling this series So Love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And he gave his son so that we might have hope for the hopeless, week one. That last week, rest for the weary, week two. This week, joy for the downhearted. And let's be real. There have been plenty of things in 2020 to, to, to make us feel a bit downhearted, haven't there? I mean, you, you just think about it. Virus, lockdown, job loss, racial injustice, protests, riots, elections, election disputes, hurricanes, wildfires, floods, economic uncertainty, and the list goes on. And your list goes on. Because in addition to all the things that we have gone through together, each of us have gone through things that, that can leave us feeling downhearted. And at this time of year, the word joy is everywhere, isn't it? It's in the songs that we hear playing. It's, it's, it's displayed in yard art and in, in, in Christmas decorations and, and ornaments to go on the tree. The, the word joy is everywhere in this season. And sometimes the experience of joy eludes us. Sometimes it's almost as though that word joy at this season mocks us haunts us, and yet we were made for joy. I love the way that Lewis Meads says this. He says, you and I were created for joy, and if we miss it, we miss the reason for our existence. God has made us to know him, to, to glorify him, and to enjoy him forever. We were made for joy. And joy is at the heart of the transformation that Jesus came to bring in our lives. This sentiment is beautifully captured by Desmond Tutu, who says, discovering more joy doesn't um, save us from the inevitability of hardships and heartbreak. In fact... We may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily too. Perhaps we're just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without becoming hard. We have heartbreaks without being broken. You and I were made for joy, and joy is at the heart of the transformation that Jesus came to bring in our lives. And this morning, I want us to talk about why we sometimes miss out on that joy that Jesus came to bring. As I studied the, the passage in Luke chapter 2 in preparation for this series, something caught my attention that, that I hadn't really paid much attention to before, that, that really stood out to me, that I think speaks to why it is that we miss out on the joy that Jesus brings and, and how it is that we can experience it. So let's look at the story together. And as we pick up the story, I wanna start where we um, covered last week to kind of set the context for what comes next. So we'll read the story we looked at last week and then we'll carry it a bit further. Luke chapter two, beginning in verse eight. And there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest 
and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So we looked at this story last week, the, the, the shepherds hanging out in the fields, these lowly, kind of despised, bottom of the rung, nobodies in that society, show us that nobody is a nobody to God, that everybody is a somebody to God. The angels come to them and make this great declaration of good news, great joy for all people. The word joy, the, the standard Greek word for joy that you see all over the place in the Bible is the word kara. But this isn't ordinary kara, ordinary joy. The, the way the author describes this is, the, the way the angel describes it is mega kara. Mega joy. Jesus came to bring us mega joy. We sang earlier, joy to the world. That great Christmas hymn, perhaps the most beloved Christmas hymn of all time. I don't know, there, there are a few other contenders for that title, aren't there? But, but, but Joy to the World is one of the most beloved Christmas hymns. But did you know that it actually didn't start out as a Christmas hymn? In fact, it didn't start out as a song at all. It's a poem written by Isaac Watts for a book of poetry that he was writing actually on the book of Psalms. So what Watts was doing was going through the book of Psalms and he was writing a poem that was his personal reflection on each one of the Psalms. And Joy to the World, the original poem, was actually his reflection on Psalm 98. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. This evoked this poem. It was actually not until over a century later that Watts' poem was slightly adapted and set to music to become one of the most beloved Christmas carols of all time. And my favorite little stanza of that great song is where it says, no more let sin or sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. This is the message of the angels, mega joy to all the world. For the Lord has come and he's come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Mega joy. And so the shepherds then respond and we pick up then the story there in verse 16. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told." Now, it's interesting to me that it says the, the shepherds hurried off and they found Mary. And I, I just love sort of imagining what that process must have been like, right? I mean, they, they were given fairly sketchy details. You'll find the baby laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. So are they like running around town, like knocking on doors or peeking through windows or listening for the sound of a baby crying? I mean, I have a feeling they sort of garnered some attention just trying to locate where is this baby? And then they find him. And they begin to tell those who have gathered there, the, the parents, the extended family of Joseph, and perhaps others from the town who, in all the commotion, have joined the, the crowd. They begin to tell them about their encounter with the angels. The angels' declaration of good news, of great joy for all the people, that, that he will be the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And we see three responses that come out of all of this that's taken place. First, we see the response of the shepherds. That they're, they're dedicated to telling everybody what they've seen, what they've heard. Then we see the response of the people that are gathered there. And it says that they are amazed. And I can't help but think that at least some of it is the amazement of incredulity, right? That, that some of them are going, are you kidding me? Seriously, you, you, you expect me to believe that you heard from an angel and that this baby laying in a cattle trough is 
the Messiah, the, the Lord. But, but there is a, an amazement that, that strikes all that have heard this story. But then we see the response of Mary. It says that Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. What are the, these things that Mary treasured and pondered? Well, I think likely it's the, it's the whole story, right? The whole uh, series of events surrounding Christmas that Mary treasures and ponders. She thinks back to the, the time that the angel appeared to her out of nowhere, and she was terrified. And the angel says, Mary, you're, you're, you're gonna have a baby. It's gonna be conceived in your womb through the Holy Spirit. And Mary, who is held up as the, the model of discipleship, says, let it be unto me as you have spoken. Mary surrenders herself, making herself available to God. But then she has to, she has to get up the courage to go try to explain this to Joseph, who's not very likely to believe such a story, right? But then she, she thinks about when Joseph came back to her and, and said, I've seen and heard from an angel too. She, she thinks about, she, she treasures and ponders the trip that she made to her cousin Elizabeth and, and how the baby in Elizabeth's womb danced for joy when, she, when he heard Mary's voice. She thinks back to the, the, the time that Joseph came and broke the news to her that they were gonna have to travel the 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem because of the census. Are you kidding me? A nine months pregnant? And, and how, by the way, how did, how did Mary get from, from Bethlehem to Nazareth, that 90 mile trip? How'd she get there? A donkey, right? That's the way it's depicted in, in all the art associated with Christmas. Mary traveling on a donkey, nine months pregnant. Did you realize though the tradition of Mary riding on a donkey actually isn't anywhere in the Bible? Despite its pervasiveness in all of our art, it's nowhere in the Bible. It actually comes from a mid-second century apocryphal writing about Mary's life that talks about her riding on a donkey. There's a really good chance there was no donkey. There's a really good chance that Mary waddled like my wife in Target all the way those 90 miles from Bethlehem, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. This long, arduous journey, and then they arrive at Joseph's family and discover that the guest room is, is full, and they're stuck with the animals. And then Mary says, it's, it's time. This is happening now. But it's there, surrounded by the animals, that she has that moment. After all of the pain and travail of labor, her precious little baby is laid into her arms. It's there she has that moment, joy. And it's all of these things that Mary treasures and ponders in her heart. And I think Mary's response is profoundly instructive for us. Because I think part of the reason that we fail to, to experience the joy, the mega joy that Jesus came to bring, despite all of the circumstances we might be going through, part of the reason that we fail to experience that is because we fail to treasure and ponder. That we fail to experience joy, I believe, because we fail to live what we might call the contemplative life. Treasuring it says, is Mary's first response. And you might want to circle those two verbs that, that capture Mary's response so that you see them every time you read the story. She treasured these things. And, and the language of treasuring is language of affection. And, and, and pondering is the language of attention. She gave her affection and her attention to these things. She treasured the language of affection. It's, it's, it's as though she guarded them. She held on to them. She treasured them in her heart. Then she pondered. She thought deeply. She contemplated. She gave her attention. If, if treasure is the language of the heart, then, then ponder is the language of the mind. And these two things go together to create what we might call 
a contemplative life. There's a, a, a fascinating book. Uh, I got to get the title right. It's a, a great title. Um, a book called, uh, here it is, Salty Wives, uh, Savvy Mothers. No, I'm sorry. I didn't get it right. Salty Wives, Spirited Mothers, and Savvy Widows. How's that for a book title? It's actually a book about the amazing female characters in the Gospel of Luke. And in that book, the author Scott Spencer says this about this idea of Mary pondering. He says, this is no mere meditative exercise, but rather a deliberate, determined act of problem solving, discerning the significance of God's dealings with the world. Far from daydreaming or musing about curious events, Mary engages her mind and heart. The center of will and purpose, as well as thought and emotion, to ascertain the solid truth. Mary ponders, thinks deeply about what God is up to. We sometimes hear that song around this time of year, Mary, did you know? <laughs> the answer is yes, she did. She pondered these things. She, she thought deeply about what God was up to. She treasured and pondered the faithfulness of God to her life and to the world. And I think part of the reason that we fail to experience the joy that Jesus came to bring is because we fail to treasure and to ponder. We, we fail to give our affection and our attention to God. We just get so busy, so wrapped up in the things of this world that, that there are so many other things that vie for our affection and our attention. Listen to this passage from Henry Nouwen. This is remarkable. I think it so speaks to our experience. Nouwen says this. He says, one of the most obvious characteristics of our daily lives is that we are busy. We experience our days as filled with things to do, people to meet, projects to finish, letters to write, calls to make, and appointments to keep. Our lives often seem like overpacked suitcases bursting at the seams. Anybody else resonate with that? In fact, we are almost always aware of being behind schedule. There's a nagging sense that there are unfinished tasks, unfulfilled promises, and unrealized proposals. There's always something else that we should have remembered, done, or said. There are always people that we did not speak to, write to, or visit. Thus, although we are very busy we have a lingering feeling of never really fulfilling our obligations. Is this resonating with anybody else like it does with me? He goes on, beneath our worrying lives, however, something else is going on. While our minds and hearts are filled with many things and we wonder how we can live up to the expectations imposed upon us by ourselves and others, we have a deep sense of unfulfillment. While busy with and worried about many things, we seldom feel truly satisfied, at peace, at home. A gnawing sense of being unfulfilled underlies our filled lives. The great paradox of our time is that many of us are busy and bored at the same time. Is it just me or does that describe the reality that you often live to? And here's what's remarkable about that passage from now on. He wrote that in 1981. <laughs> he wrote that before the internet, before Facebook and, and Instagram, before the 24 hour news cycle, before so many of the things that capture our affection and attention today. And yet the reality is there are so many things that we give our affection to, that we give our attention to, we give our hearts and give our minds to, and that steal the joy that Jesus came to bring. We fail to experience the joy that Jesus came to bring because we fail to live contemplative lives, lives where we give to God our affection 
and our attention. And so as we wrap up this morning, I just have some diagnostic questions for you this Advent season. Some things for you to ponder, to consider. You may want to write them down and, and, and go back to them this week. And the first question is simply this. What's getting your affection and attention these days? What are the things that you're giving your heart and mind to? Election results, Twitter feeds, stock market, the dismal excuse for a football team that is the Dallas Cowboys in 2020. When I thought about that question for my own life, there were some things that immediately came to my mind that, that, that I think are, are, are stealing joy from me this Advent season. They're getting the best of my heart and the best of my mind. What, what are the things that get, are getting your affection and your attention these days? The second question is this. What are the things that stir your affections for Jesus? This, this is a question that all of us need to be aware of in our own spiritual lives, that, that we need to consider deeply. What are the things in my life? What are the practices, the rhythms, the times, the places, the ways, the things that stir my affection for Jesus? Is it music or, or nature or, or worship or, or just extended time with God in the scriptures? What are those things that, that stir your affection for Jesus? The, the love of God is on display all around us, and yet we so often miss it. In the words of the, the great old hymn writer, he shines in all that's fair. And this will change our lives if we'll actually begin to see the way in which he shines in all that's fair. The, the, the way in which all that brings us joy and delight is ultimately from God. And we begin to recognize those things as expressions of his love for us. What are the things that stir your affection for Jesus and engage those intentionally this Advent season. The third question is this. What are those things that rob your affection from Jesus? What are those things in your life that, that you give your heart to that, that you know actually pulls you away from your relationship with Christ? We need to be able to identify the things that, that are the, the competitors in our hearts our affection for Jesus, to name them, to know them, to share them with a trusted friend. What are the things that rob your affection from Jesus? And then finally, when this week will you carve out time to give attention to Jesus? Do you have a regular habit of spending time with God? of engaging with the scriptures, of reminding yourself of all the ways in which he has been faithful to you and to the world? When this week will you carve out time to give your attention to Jesus? Because friends, I believe that Jesus came to bring us mega joy, but we fail to experience that joy because we fail to treasure and to ponder. We fail to give our affection and our attention. We fail to live a contemplative life. This Advent season, let us be people who experience the joy that Jesus came to bring. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that Jesus came to bring us joy, not just ordinary joy, but mega joy, great joy. And we acknowledge before you, Lord, that there are things in our lives and things in our world that, that, that are battling to try to, to rob us of the joy that Jesus came to bring. And sometimes we give our attention and our affection to those things. But we pray, Lord, that we would be people who this Advent season truly do experience the joy that Jesus came to bring. That we would recognize that we are in a time that, that we are so busy and so distracted, and yet we need to carve out space in our lives. We need to engage in practices in our lives that take our eyes, 
that take our hearts, that take our minds off of all of those competitors and put them on you and your goodness to us, your faithfulness to us. To live lives of affection and attention, of contemplation before you. Help us, Lord, to experience your joy this Advent season. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.